let's go back and get some income in for Logan. Um, it indicated to us that he was a paralegal for a law firm, so he should be receiving a W-2. And in all of these assignments, um, it doesn't actually show you an image of the W-2. It usually just tells you what his salary was. And we'll assume that all the proper taxes were withheld from that as far as Social Security and Medicare taxes. So let's go ahead and get his income in there. We're going to indicate that he had W-2 wages at interest income. So we know he had that. If for some reason you didn't mark one of these boxes, you'll have an opportunity to come back in or you can kind of jump in and add any information down the road as you, you know, read through the problem and figure out there's more that needs to be added. So again, this is meant for people who are actually filing their own tax return. So they're looking for all sorts of information here, which we don't have about, um, about Logan's job. This would be like his employer's information. So let's see if it's going to let us skip this. It did. Okay, so you can just kind of skip through there. Um, his wages are 80000 He had federal income tax of 5500 withheld from his wages. So that is the amount we're going to put here. And then for our purposes, we're going to be blank. And all of this, we're not going to worry too much about, except the state information here. Under Logan's expenditures, this is on page 3-52, that he had taxes, state of Missouri income taxes, and his state wages should be the same as his regular wages, and his income tax withheld during 2015 was 3200 we want to make sure we get the federal income tax withheld and the state income tax withheld along with the total salary on this screen. I'm just going to skip through these things and there we go. We have our, our first um, bit of information there. Again, if you were ever doing this tax return for yourself, you'd want to fill in all of the boxes according to your W-2. But for our purposes, as long as we get all the information that needs to show up on the tax return, we're okay. The reason they request that other information is when they e-file an actual tax return, they compare that to the real W-2s. But we're just doing sample ones. So. so now when we come back to our Form 1040, we can see that the wages, line 7, 80,000 popped right up there. So that's good. And then also on the second page here, we will see on line 64 that the federal income tax withheld from his W-2 shows up there, 5500 So we know that we got that information incorrect because it's showing up in the right place. And that's the only wages we have, so we are done there. Now we have some interest to add. Looks like he had some interest from uh, Omni Bank. This says regular interest in income, so we know that that should probably go right here with interest income, box one. Again, we don't have the actual form 1099 interest, so you just need to go according to what the textbook indicates. So just plain interest income. And that's all we have for that one. But it also says he has a savings account at Boone State Bank, so let's add another 1099 for that. Okay. So we have both of those. Now we also have um, a City of Springfield general purpose bond, $3,000. And I think we learned in this chapter, I think it points out in Exhibit 3.1 on page 3-4, that um, bonds are not taxed federally. So they are tax exempt um, interest there. However, even though it's tax exempt, we still need to input it and report it to the IRS. And that's your tax exempt interest. I might be able to put it here. We'll see. We'll see how it treats it. So we know that we have some bonds to interest, right? And we know that that's not taxable. So we're putting it down there. And now we're going to go look 
Let's go look and see how it's treating it on the form. And you'll notice we're getting more and more forms as we go along because all of these extra schedules and worksheets feed into our main Form 1040. So here we have the 1400, that's our 1100 and our 300 in interest. And here on line 8B, tax exempt interest, that's where we want to see the $3,000 because it's not getting added in to the total incomes here, but it is being reported just so the IRS knows, hey, we made some tax exempt interest. Um, we're not paying you tax on it, but this is how much we made. So we don't have that 3000 there. That means I didn't get it in the right box. So let's go back and see. Maybe we'll just put it straight on this line here. Like I said, I don't use this software a ton, so this is not applicable because we aren't doing state tax. Okay, so now let's go look. And there's our number. So that's where you, you should put it. Go ahead and put it on that tax exempt interest line on the 1099 interest input to make sure it shows up there. And this is key. This number gets forgotten a lot. So I'm always going to be looking on your tax returns to make sure you are reporting that tax exempt interest. Okay. Let's see what else we have here. Um, he doesn't have any extra income from a business, but there are some other items here that we should address quickly. It says that he received an inheritance from Daniel. I think that might be his father who passed away, or his uncle. Um, he had received an inheritance from Daniel. Um, securities worth 60000 and also an insurance policy with a maturity value of 200000 Then also a lot, an investment lot that he turned around and sold and some other um, miscellaneous type properties. As far as the, the life insurance proceeds, again we learned that life insurance proceeds are not taxable in most situations. So, so in this situation it's not taxable, we're just going to ignore that. Also, most inheritances are going to be non-taxable as well. So that 60000 that he inherited, we um, don't need to do anything with that. However, um, the sale of the lot that was held as an investment, we are going to have to report that. Essentially how we kind of treat that is we know what it was purchased for. The lot in St. Louis was purchased on May 2nd, 2010 for $85,000 and held as an investment. As the neighborhood has deteriorated, Logan decided to cut his losses and sold the lot on January 5th for $80,000. Because he's actually selling real estate here, we need to report that. Oh, that's what I should show you. You can also click up here and it will show you all the different inputs and you can just jump right to it. Instead of getting the constant questions and trying to answer their questions. So this is actually, as you get more familiar doing tax returns, um, this is probably the better way to go to navigate yourself through H&R Block. So, for example, right now we're dealing with an investment. We're dealing with a sale of investment property. So we just are going to click right here and we're going to add the asset. You can use this assistant if you want to try and inf enter information. I'm going to go with the quick entry. So a description of the property, we have a lot in St. Louis. And there's no specific rules to how you describe things. We just kind of, <clears throat> whatever's going to best help you know what you're talking about. Uh, it indicated to us that he purchased it. It was purchased on 5-2 of 2010. And the purchase price was 85000 
And then he turned around and sold it on 1-5-2015 for 80000 We're not dealing with any special type here, so we can leave that blank. No adjustments. And we can see here that his total loss was $5,000. So let's go look at our tax return and see if that hit. So here we go, line 13, capital gains, and it shows a $3,000 loss. However, we know that we had a $5,000 loss. Um, and the reason for this, as we learned in the chapter, is that it limits losses on these types on investments to, to $3,000. Um, so he has $2,000 extra dollars now of loss that were unabsorbed basically and are going to be carried over to 2016. So assuming he has no other sales, in 2016 his tax return right here will show negative 2000 and that will be his difference. So um, that's good to keep in mind. Another form here we can open up. Schedule D. And this is the flow through we can actually see the detail to the 80 to the home that was sold. So here we see that the proceeds were 80,000, the basis was 85, his total loss was 5,000. And then as you come down, it will indicate the limits here, 3,000. So you can kind of figure out, okay, why do I only have 3000 sitting there? And as you kind of look at the Schedule D, it can give you some insight as to what is showing on the Form 1040. Okay, so we've got the sale of the property. It also told us about that property that he sold, that he had inherited. And basically the rule on that is property that you inherit, that you're going to sell, you base the value of that property on the day that you inherited it because somebody passed away and because he sold it pretty much right after he got it and of course it was worth more I mean there's likely no sort of tax gain that could be recognized if anything he probably had a loss on the sale of this um, personal property and the loss is because it's personal it can't be recognized so we don't need to put that on the tax return at all um, it has no effect on your income taxes. So it also lists here, I, well, let's see, as far as income is concerned, I think we've captured all the income. So we shouldn't have any other income to deal with here. Adjustments, it didn't really show us in the text that he had any sort of adjustments that we need to take. So we can skip right over that. We can go to deductions, which we'll address in the next video.